Hi, my name's Jaina and I'm an admissions rep with Kansas State University Online. I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight to learn more about our community development program. I'm joined by department head and program director, Dr. Houston Gibson, program coordinator, Virginia Bruner, and Great Plains IDEA lead campus coordinator, Ashley Schultz. Throughout the presentation, we will be using the chat feature and answering questions as they are being asked. Some of your questions may be saved until the end of the presentation to answer. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ashley. All right, thank you so much, Dana. Welcome everyone. Um, we appreciate taking time out of your busy day to join us and we are excited that you are interested in the community development program. Um, like Jana mentioned, my name is Ashley Schultz and I am the Great Plains IDEA Campus Coordinator for the programs here at K-State. Um, so today we will be going over um, just a broad overview of what Great Plains IDEA is, as well as the community development program. Then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, as we go along, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat. Um, also, to start us off, we would love to have you put in the chat where you are joining us from today. All right, so just a bit about Great Plains IDEA. Um, first, we are a national consortium of 19 universities offering online flexible programs, and four of those 19 universities partnered together to form the Community Development Program. Um, this gives you really a unique opportunity to take online courses taught by multiple universities, and also you'll benefit from the diverse perspectives and the unique strengths brought by classmates, as well as expert faculty at each of our partner universities. Um, in addition, you will collaborate with classmates and expert faculty, providing you with a great opportunity to, opportunity to expand your professional network. Um, so next, how does Great Plains IDEA work? Um, first, you will apply and be admitted to one university, which will become your home university. So, for example, K-State. Um, once you are admitted, you will then enroll in all your courses and pay the GPID a common price through your home university of K-State. However, during your time in the program, you will end up taking courses taught by any of our community development partner universities. Each university then uses their own learning management system. So myself and the campus coordinators at the teaching university will help you get set up with course access each semester. Um, then in the end, when you complete all your coursework, the degree or certificate is awarded by your home university, which would be K-State. Um, so next, let's take a look at this short two minute video and it will go over a little more in detail on how GPIDEA works. Are you having trouble deciding which university has the best online college degree programs? Why limit your opportunities to just one university? Through Great Plains IDEA, you can earn an online degree in high demand professional fields while taking classes from several of our 19 member universities. Not only will you interact with students and peers from all over the world, you will also learn from faculty all over the country. Great Plains IDEA provides faculty a creative way to come together, maximize their skills and knowledge, and develop a student-centered program that prepares you for the next phase of your career. So how does Great Plains IDEA work? You choose one home university, and while you'll enroll and pay tuition there, your courses will be taught completely online by faculty from each of the member universities. When you complete your coursework, your degree is awarded by your home university. Students pay the same common price per credit hour, regardless of which university is teaching the course. That means no out-of-state tuition or distance delivery fees. Plus, you don't have to worry about transferring credits. Great Plains IDEA can help you earn your degree as you learn from the best faculty at our member universities. Whether you are ready to advance your career, thinking about changing careers, or a recent graduate, Great Plains IDEA is right for you. Your future, our idea. All right, we're great. Hopefully this will give you a little better understanding of how Great Plains IDEA works. Um, definitely put any questions into the chat and we can um, help get those answered. Um, next, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Houston Gibson. 
Hello, uh, I'm Houston. Uh, nice to for everyone to join us here online for, for the Zoom. Uh, again, as Ashley said, if there's any questions, feel free to put them into the chat. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, picking up where, where, where Ashley left off with the Great Pines idea and looking at the community development program and the four universities and kind of how we work together. Um, in, the, in the community development program with Great Plains IDEA, uh, K-State is one of the four partner institutions. Students enroll and take courses through all four institutions and faculty are, are, are teaching from all four institutions. And each different institution is housed in its own academic unit. And so as Jana mentioned at the beginning of the conversation today, I am the department head of the department here, which houses the, act, the community development program for the Department of Landscape Architecture, Regional Community Planning. We also have a Bachelor of Science in Real Estate and Community Development on campus. And then we have our online uh, community development program through the GP IDEA, which we'll talk a little bit about the different tracks that are involved with that too. So a lot of the faculty are teaching both in the on-campus programs and community planning or real estate community development and also online. A lot of times it's even the same course content and the same textbooks. Other times it's very unique faculty. The Venn diagram that you see kind of here on the right is not to mean that any of those particular topics are exclusive to any of the institutions is more of a sort of a, a, a brainstorming, if you will, that the four institutions completed a couple of years ago when we were going through and really thinking about um, what we do collectively as the four institutions and the content expertise areas that we, that we offer. And if we could advance the slide. Yes. So what is community development? Community development, um, it, that's a question that's often asked. And we really think of community development as a place-based uh, community development where it's essentially, it, it's multifaceted, but it's the common thread that most of the students have is working on the quality of life of place-based communities, making them a better place to live, work, and play uh, is kind of the simple answer. And there's a lot of ways to do that either through the nonprofit sector, um, non-governmental organizations, working for governmental entities like the city hall, the community development division, working for private entities through redevelopment projects on Main Street, or um, even banking institutions have community development outreach wings. Uh, we've had a couple of students over, the, over the, the time who work for airports, who have community development sort of extension offices uh, to work with the communities around, uh, around the airport. So it might come in many different forms, but kind of that common thread is making places better to live, work, and play. And there's a lot of ways to do that. What you learn through the program is sort of a basic skill set to um, however, whatever niche you kind of fall into, whether it's economic development or natural resource um, based community development, uh, whether, you know, working on parks or whether it's more working down on, on Main Street, the skills are, are very comparable. We look at everything through the lens of what's called the community capitals framework. We will look at asset-based community development, where you go in and you look at a place and you work with a community and you work with people in that community to identify the assets of that community, because every community has them, and how to leverage those assets in a positive way to essentially enhance the quality of, of, of life in that community. That's, in a nutshell, uh, what community development is and what you will learn in the program through the core and elective courses. So why study, why study community development at K-State? Um, we have a, a long tradition of community planning, of community development, and you're, you know, housed in the academic unit here of landscape architecture, regional community planning, where we blend sort of design and policy and that sort of thinking lens to community development. And you get to work with folks like Virginia, who you'll hear from in a minute, who are dedicated professionals to help you from the application process to the graduation uh, ceremony. And if you could advance the slide, please. Mm -hmm. So the master's degree is 36 credit hours, and regardless of which sort of capstone track, and we'll talk about that um, 
in a little bit maybe uh, through the question and answer, but there's different capstone options, whether you do an applied master's project or you do more of an academic thesis, or you can do the coursework only option, which is what I like to say 9.9 .9 out of 10 students typically choose to do, while the other options are available, most take the coursework only option, I think, because they want the extra electives, because the electives are often skill building based, uh, such as grant writing, um, such as community engagement techniques, things of that nature. So they want those skill sets. Um, but regardless of the electives or your capstone option, everyone takes the same core coursework uh, that you can kind of see here on the bullet point. I'm not going to read through every one of them, but it takes you everything from the foundations to what is community development, what do community developers do, all the way uh, to, you know, how to work and engage with communities and come up with, with policy and action plans, whether that's economic or natural resource based. And then, of course, there's 18 credits of electives. If you do the thesis or the applied project capstone, those come with elective hours. So that backs out the number of electives that you would take. Um, most courses are asynchronous with occasional synchronous Zoom sessions um, that are that are typically optional. Uh, one of the things that's uh, both a uh, positive and a challenge when it comes to online education is folks just like yourselves are in all different time zones. So there might be someone on East Coast, there might be someone on West Coast. We're here in Central. Um, it's not uncommon to even have someone who might be overseas, whether that's temporary or, 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 or permanent. But we've had folks um, that have Zoomed in from Korea, Guam, Australia, um, Africa, other places around, around the world, Rome, it, Europe. Um, okay. The certificate is a sort of a micro niche, a carved out, a more of a specialized, concentrated form of the master's degree. Two of the core courses overlap. You have CD Plan 705, Organizing for Community Change, and CD Plan 715, Principles and Strategies of Community Change, which are considered to be Informally, we call those CD1 and CD2. They're kind of the core of the core. And so whether you take the master's program or you take the certificate program, you take the core of the core. And then for your six credit hours of electives in the certificate, these can be from the other core offerings or they can be from the elective offerings um, or a little bit of mix and match of each. The and one thing I should note about the certificate and the, and the master's degree is they're fully stackable. So if you were to start, say, in the certificate de degree, you can, you can earn the certificate on your way to the master's degree. And so you can continue on and use the courses for both. Both students have the opportunity uh, to, um, to be in either um, the, or both, both, Student populations have the opportunity to be in the Community Development Student Committee or the CDSC. Slide. Career paths. Um, community regions, these are just a laundry list um, about. Oh, I see a good question from, from Nick down there. The, the answer is it you are able to get it on the way without additional cost. Uh, and we'll get to all the questions in, in just a minute. Uh, good question. The career paths, uh, these, are, these are some of the careers that current alumni are working in. Um, we're not going to go through each one individually, but you can kind of look through and kind of see that the how it kind of parlays to what I was saying earlier where not everything, there, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it, whether you're looking at it from a planning lens, an economic lens, a health lens, a, a natural resource management lens. But again, the commonality is the bettering of place-based communities and communities of, of Go ahead and slide. Um, Virginia, I will turn it over to you at this point, and you can talk a little bit about the application requirements and uh, sort of the processes behind the, well, behind from an administration standpoint. Absolutely, yes, this is my part. This is my favorite part. So the application requirements 
Um, so we're going to start specifically with the master's portion. So master's and certificate have a little have a few different requirements. So for the master's degree, um, you need to have a bachelor's degree um, with a 3.0 minimum GPA in final two years of the degree or approximately the last 60 credit hours. Um, if someone does not quite have a 3.0 minimum GPA, we still strongly encourage people to apply. Um, people can get conditional um, admission based on um, certain factors. So we can work with the graduate school typically for things like that. Um, things that are also asked for in the application are what's called the letter of intent. So you would want to state your um, things like what you would want to do with your community development degree. Um, also, your you would want to have three professional or academic references. And then also initially your unofficial transcripts and then on admission, the graduate school would then ask for your official transcripts. Um, also to note here with the applications, applications are accepted year round. So we don't only accept students only in the spring or only in the fall. Um, we can accept students in May, in March, in June, in October, does not matter. And students should plan to apply, preferably, you know, prior to the start of the semester, obviously. Um, and then we do have three start, we have three semesters in the spring, in the summer, and then in the fall. And the application fee, um, there is an application fee of $65, or for international students, it is $75. For the certificate, which is a little bit different. Okay, so certificate is similar. Again, bachelor's degree with 3.0 minimum GPA in final two years and similar with the credit hours, except that rather than have the statement of intent, you only need to have the unofficial transcripts. But also, as Dr. Gibson stated, the courses taken for the certificate apply towards the master's degree. So those courses stack. So those courses do not need to be repeated. Okay. We have some, again, frequently asked questions. So when do we accept students? Um, we have the rolling admissions. So we accept students at any time. So feel free to apply at any time to the program. Classes are offered in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall. Are there any additional fees? No. So the, let's see here. So the fees that you see, there are zeros to the credit hours. So right now the, let's see here, the, let's see, the fees are, what is it, 600, Dr. Gibson? Yes. Yep, it is $600 per credit hour. So if you're taking a three credit hour course, it would be those three credit hours. And as Dr. Gibson mentioned, um, some of the courses are asynchronous um, with, you know, a little bit of synchronous. What kind of support will I get as an online student? Um, you typically would work with me. You would email me with questions. Um, you would work with me from the time that you start asking questions. Um, you would work with me all the way up until your graduation. You would also get support then with Ashley and also then with Miss Jaina as well. Okay, and Dr. Gibson? Yeah, I'll talk a little about the job market. Two things I wanna uh, just re-emphasize the fees. There are no additional fees and that is really important. Uh, that is not always the case at other programs. Even other programs at K-State, that's not always the case. Fees are, are often associated with, with College, uh, they are separate than tuition. So a lot of times when you see tuition, you, you you should ask if there are extra fees or not. The GPID of programs do not have any additional fees. And so that's a, a, that's a, a real benefit there. Um, and the other support I might mention, in addition to um, everything Virginia mentioned, online students have full access to the library. Uh, one of the things that was really neat that, that I found out a few years ago is the library through interlibrary loan will actually mail you a book as long as you uh, are in the lower 48. 
uh, they will they will put a book in the mail, and if it's sitting in the library and you can't find it in your local town, you can you can open up your your mailbox and and and, and get it because the librarian will ship it to you. And there's online library chat functions, and there's writing tutorials, and the career services that are offered here on how to write a resume, and 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 all of the tips of the trade, which going into the job market are all completely available to online students, the same as they are on campus students. And through Zoom and chat functions, there's always someone there to kind of answer the, the call. So it's a lot better than it was just 10 years ago. It's it's pretty, pretty great uh, in terms of uh, access there. And the job market is better too. Uh, the job market is pretty hot right now for not just this discipline, but really across the board, whatever uh, someone is interested in studying, the job market um, is there, there, there tends to be more jobs at the moment than there, than there are applicants. Um, obviously, that ebbs and flows over the years. That's what it's like right now. I'm going to read something from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that I, I encourage you to, to, to look up uh, when you're thinking about the careers that you might go down. And I'm going to read it only because I don't want to get it wrong. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics states that the job growth rate for community of social service specialists and managers is 12% and 17% respectively, which is much faster than the average job growth nationally. While community development professionals do not make up the total of the job positions for the community of social services specialists and managers categories, they make up a critical niche providing place-based community expertise for the built environment and other disciplines do not innately include. Uh, community development professionals work in the sectors of nonprofit organizations, example, affordable housing programs, government, example, environmental and transportation agencies, corporate entities, example, social responsibility divisions or initiatives, social institutions, example, job training as economic development, and financial enterprises, example, banking institutions, community investment and or venture capital programs. Community development offers a holistic view of communities compared to more specific technical focused disciplines, which may work symbiotically with and within a community development framework. So that is kind of the, uh, the data from the BLS, and that's projecting data from 2019 to 2029. So we're kind of on the, on the front half of that. So the job market is currently good and the prospects um, look better than average uh, from, from a national level, which is a, a good thing. Uh, go ahead and slide. Okay, so I guess it's time for our, our Q&A, the, the, the fun part. Go back. Atlanta, Georgia, all right. I was born in Atlanta, fun fact. So uh, who was who that, Willette from, moved to Dallas from Atlanta. Um, Welcome, glad you could join us. Does certificate come along? With, does certificate come along with the masters? Is there additional cost? What does that look like? There are no additional costs. It does not automatically come along, but if you declare it, then you will get it. So essentially, after you've taken the two core courses and another six credit hours of electives that are embedded that you will take anyway along the way through the community map master's program, you can declare that certificate, but you have to kind of make that effort. It's not an additional cost, but it is sort of a form to fill out. And um, for, that's a great example. If you forget that answer, that's when you call Virginia and say, hey, Virginia, how do I get that certificate? And she'll send you the link for the form. Um, and it's pretty easy. Um, and no, there's no additional cost. I believe that my GPA undergrad, um, we should talk down the road. I, one of the things that we do, this is a really good question because you've worked in the realm of community development. We feel, the, so the, a few years ago, this number may or may not still be accurate because I think it was about three years ago when last time I pulled the data, but the average age in the program was, I believe, 35, somewhere in the mid 30s. We have students in this program every, everywhere from you know 22, just graduate from undergrad, uh, a lot of folks are applying during their senior year of, of undergrad. We also have had students as, as, as senior as 72 who are lifelong learners that are working in their community. A lot of the student, in fact, a big bulk of the student body are 
10 years ish into their career and have kind of chosen to come back to get a graduate degree for usually one of two reasons. One, because they are already working in the field and do not have the credential. So this program helps them get that credential to kind of solidify um, their job title, the promotion, the raise. Another student is someone who has not necessarily been working in the field, but wants to work in the field. So they might have spent some time in other places. And so they're kind of making a career change. We, it is very common to see folks who have been working in the realm of community development, whatever that may look like, for seven, 10 years and have been doing an amazing job and, and have high letters of recommendation from their employer, have high letters of recommendation from their, from their peers. They don't quite have that GPA. We feel that that life experience matters quite a bit. And, you know, it, it definitely takes precedent. What you've been doing for the last seven years as an adult definitely takes precedent over a course that you might not have done as well as you could have when you were in undergrad 19 20 years old uh, that happens and so absolutely you should still apply and absolutely i think that's something where you know you kind of talk with us talk with virginia on the front end and you kind of we want to make sure that your letter of intent is explicit uh so that you have the opportunity to talk about the real world experience that you're able to bring and pull from uh, we'll want to make sure that your letters of recommendation are from the appropriate people uh, who will usually be, you know, either direct supervisors or um, folks in the community that you have been working with as 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 colleagues. And I have seen, I, I've been part of this program for about 12, 13 years, 12 years. I, I, I started at K-State in 2010. I have seen some many, many students that did not do as well as they would have liked to have done in their undergraduate studies, but have found what they wanted to do in the work arena, be very successful in this pro pro program, graduate and go on to be very successful in, in their careers. Uh, one of the things that I my philosophy that I believe with education is we do better when we're doing something we want to do. And so a lot of times in undergrad, we're kind of cobbling together lots of different courses and we're bouncing around. I changed my major three times, I believe, as an undergraduate student um, because I wasn't it wasn't clear what I wanted to do. And then when I was when I was able to find that thing, um, it wasn't it wasn't challenging anymore. It, it, it was I mean, there were still challenges involved. But it, it was it was a fun challenge. It wasn't his work, and so it was much easier to be successful. And I think community development, the master's program, and not just the master's program in the courses, but the career and the discipline and the profession is truly one of those professions where it's it's if somebody is passionate about it and somebody wants to do it, they're 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 probably going to be great. And and so I think you know that's something that you um, want want to follow up with us on. Uh, how many credit hours per semester is it custom to take? Typically, we recommend that a full-time student takes two courses a semester or six credit hours. And so it's kind of designed that way that it, we are a spring, summer, fall curriculum. So if you take two courses a semester or six credits a semester, it's a two-year program. And so if you take that full semester for six semesters in a row, not every student goes through at that or that pace. Um, we've had students that have said, you know, I, I'm not in a hurry and I've got a lot of things on my plate. I just like to take one course a semester. That's fine. Sometimes a student says, you know what, I, I'm going to take the summer off uh, to kind of spend some time on vacation and come back in the fall. That's fine. So you don't have to go straight through at that level. We've had other students who say, you know what, I'm on rails and I'm just ready to get my career on, on, on jumpstart. I don't want to take nine credits a semester and just get this done. And they've been very successful too. So it's really up to the student on how many. Six is what we recommend as a full-time load. Um, three to, to nine is within reason. I, I, another thing I, I would say about that that's important is there are not lockstep order to the courses. We recommend the foundations course on the front end if you're in the master's program, just because it truly is that course that kind of sets the foundations of this is 
what community development is. This is what you're going to be doing. That's it, That course is much more valuable to you as a student on the front end than it is on the back end. So we recommend you take that one first. But other than that, there's no prescribed order. You can take it in the order of your preference. And Virginia works with you on that from an advising standpoint to make sure that you're sort of flagging the electives that you want to take and you're flagging when you're going to take your core so that you create a plan and a program of study that works for you. And I know, um, Virginia, do you want to say anything more about that or perhaps the work sheets that you've developed and you work with students on? Yeah, so regardless of whether you, uh, people choose to do a certificate or a master's, um, there I created a PDF for the certificate and there was already one for the master's um, that the that students can use. And then we go through and kind of plug in when people take which courses and that kind of helps to track when people take which courses. And then we work through, we can set up meetings and then say, these courses are offered this semester, these courses are offered that semester. And it kind of helps people to figure out when they want to take certain courses because some courses are offered more frequently than others. Um, so like foundations is offered in the spring and the fall. Some courses are offered every spring or every fall. Some are offered every other spring or every other fall. So if there's a course that you're really interested in taking, you would want to take that course more than you would something that's not you know going to be there every time. So to say. And we yeah. have another question. Like. You have another question about the weight of a master's degree. I, I mm -hmm. regularly browse. So we have a when you're a student in our program, you are enrolled in our constant contact newsletter, which is called the LARCP -L -L Pulse. And so the Pulse comes out every Tuesday. And every Tuesday, we have all the job offerings and all the internship offerings. And so we, we, we're we getting them all week long and says, hey, can you spread the word about this job in this county or this city or, or this firm? And so those all go into the pulse and it goes an ongoing list. And if you look at the job listings, it will often say master's degree in this discipline or allied field. And so a master's discipline often is sort of that, that, that that career and salary sort of ceiling breaker um, that you'll find it, it it's hard to answer the question specifically because it depends exactly like where you work or what you're going to do right but you will see that a lot of times in the community development field that master's degree is pretty much the difference between an entry level position and the senior positions and so that kind of that that next that next step. Good question. Yeah. So it, I don't know the amount of weight, but um, it it adds weight. And and again, that's like, that's why I would say a good portion of the students are in the program. The other thing I would say about that, because I think it's really fun. I, I enjoy the fact that students uh, like yourselves right right now are all all over the country listening. That's the way courses are too. So you'll have students in um, California, you'll have students in Kansas, you'll have students in Alabama, you'll have students in New York. And the way the projects work in the courses, because it's a community development course, they're community-based projects where the assignments will say, okay, go out in your community and look at these things and talk to these people and do that over the next couple of weeks and then come back. And then we're going to uh, share with each other. And so you go out in California and your classmate goes out in Kansas and your other classmate goes out in Florida and you you look in your communities. This community is a rural community. This community is a neighborhood in a larger city. And you're, you're, you're but you're looking at kind of the same sort of criteria, whether that's about housing, whether that's about economics, whether that's about transportation options. And then you come back and you share with each other what you find. And one of the things that I find the most valuable in the courses, um, and your courses kind of hover around 20 people, 15 to 25 is, is sort of the, the range of a, of a course, or so 20, 20 people in a class, and you've got people from 20 different locations looking at 20 different cities, and you're comparing those notes. You're like, wow, these are the things that are the same, and these are the things that are different. And this is what the textbook said. And I, I can kind of see how why the textbook, even though it was written by somebody in this state, applies over here to this state. And, and you can sort of see that happening in real time 
and from a community development program to, to from my experience and to me. All right. Well, I want to thank Dr. Gibson, Virginia, and Ashley for their presentation. And I want to thank everyone for joining us here tonight. If you're ready, ready to apply, please visit our website at online.ksu.edu and select how to apply for detailed instructions. Everyone who is registered for this webinar will be receiving a recording via email as soon as it's available. We also want to let everyone know that we have application fee waivers available for those who attended the webinar live tonight and who are applying for the summer or fall 2023 semester. Please reach out to us at online at ksu.edu when you are ready to apply and we will provide you with the code. Finally, if you have any additional questions that we didn't cover tonight, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks again and I hope you all have a great night.